Simply Financial with Christopher Calandra, Certified Financial Planner, is an innovative, comprehensive, informative, and cutting-edge podcast that discusses financial topics ranging from personal finance, economics, politics, and personal growth. Simply Financial will cover intriguing and thought-provoking questions so that the listener can simply increase their financial IQ. Welcome to Episode 51 of Season Number 3 of the Simply Financial Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Calandra. Thanks for joining me today. I have with me uh, a guest, Arlene Kogan. She is a speaker and best-selling author of the book, Give to Live. She is also the founder of Arlene Kogan Consulting. And the topic is the gift of giving. So Arlene, thank you so much for joining me. Maybe you could start by just telling me and my listeners a little bit about your background. Well, I spent my time on Wall Street helping people make money, and it was a blast. But then I had two daughters, and while working on Wall Street was fun, I also experienced sexual harassment, the glass ceiling, and wage discrimination. And having two daughters made me decide that I wanted to lead by example and show them that they could have a job that was fulfilling and get paid well and not deal with any of the BS. So we moved to from the East Coast out to Portland, Oregon, which is where I am now, and I saw a career coach, and everything came up, philanthropy and benevolence. And it took me five years. And I found a position with the Oregon Community Foundation, which happens to be the ninth largest community foundation in the country, where I worked on the exact opposite side. Instead of helping people grow their money and make money, I helped people give it away. And it was an extremely rewarding position. But when I was there, I noticed that there was just a lack of understanding and communication about how to give. So I decided at that point, after nine years with the foundation, to go out on my own and really teach individuals how to give in ways that solved personal and financial problems and also work with their advisors so the advisors could help build comprehensive financial plans that dealt with personal, financial, and also left their clients the ability to make a charitable gift they never imagined. And I have to say, it's all because I had two daughters that made me switch careers. And I'm so thankful because it's a fabulous space to be in. Very good. So this is not something that was an overnight change. It's something that was an evolution for you after meeting with the career coach and finding your way to the foundation, leading to you setting up your consulting firm, right? Exactly. It's been a, it's been a long path and journey, and I've met amazing people along the way. So, so I know this is a very base question, but in your mind, having experienced so much in the world of charity and philanthropy, what are the benefits of giving. Uh, Can you talk about some of that? Sure. And, you know, I really want to focus on one in particular that I don't think people focus on enough. And that is that giving actually makes us happy. And there's an associate professor from Harvard named Michael Norton, who worked with Elizabeth Dunn with the University of British Columbia, and they did a whole study on happiness. And what they did is they took two envelopes. They they found a bunch of participants, and they took a bunch of envelopes. And students at the campus of the University of British Columbia received an envelope with either $5 or $20 in it, and instructions that said either spend the money on yourself or spend it on others. And at the end of the day, we're going to call and and see how happy you are, if it changed your opinion at all in your outlook for the day. And while money didn't matter, what they found was that people who spent the money on themselves had no change in their being, 
But those who spent it on other people felt happier and more satisfied for the day. And then this went out to the Pew Research Company, and they did it worldwide with over 200,000 people in 136 countries. And they got similar results. So what Michael Norton says at the end of his TED Talk, which I just love, it's so brilliant, if you think money can't um, buy you happiness, stop spending it on yourself and try spending it on other people instead. So there's real hard science that giving makes you happy. They've done MRI scans. It lights up through your prefrontal cortex. And so there's hard science that giving makes us happier. So that's one of the huge benefits of giving. You become happier people. That is awesome. And it's probably talked about way too little in not just my industry, but just in, in general. And I could speak personally, Arlene, I'm 49 now. And I would say I've given over the course of my adult life, but not overly generous, give money to church, local causes, a few charity events each year, uh, you know, pretty good. But now, at this stage of the game, I've achieved a lot of financial goals. I'm not a multi-billionaire with my own private yacht, but I'm financially secure. I am mm -hmm. wealthy by most measures, and I have financial comfort. And now my thoughts on giving are so much more intense and mature now that I've kind of protected myself, my family, achieved success, not completely raised my uh, two kids. My son is 13. Um, but could you speak to that kind of the evolution where some people give generously throughout their lives regardless of their economic status and others I think like me they kind of grow into it as they become older more mature maybe even a little wiser and when they <laughs> achieve financial security I'm hoping I'm a little wiser but what do you think about that yeah I believe everyone for everyone even those people who you think have refined giving a sense of giving, that giving truly is a journey and it develops over time. Um, and I'll share two, well, one quick story with you from the book. I worked with a woman named Sharon and she was the first donor I met with at the, the foundation. And it was a very interesting process. Just stop being a financial advisor she walks in, and I'm all ready to help her. And she's like, my attorney sent me here. She thinks you can help me. I don't have much time left. Well, it turns out that Sharon had ovarian cancer. She had no kids. Uh, no. You know, she was financially sound. She was divorced. She could leave everything she wanted to to charity. And we drafted a fund agreement, and she was going to focus on ovarian cancer research. And I worked with Sharon for five years. And over that time, her giving went from ovarian cancer research to end-of-life care and supporting hospice. So as you get older and different things occur in your life, your giving is going to change and modify along with your experiences. You know, some people are so compelled. They went to, to college. Someone gave them a scholarship, and they would not be successful without that education. So education is critical to them, and that's the only thing they want to support. So like you, as someone either becomes more physically um, sound and more confident in their finances, your giving can grow, but it does change and evolve over time. You're absolutely right about that. And, th and that's why I always say with my philanthropy and in the book, enjoy the journey. Mm, very good. Um, the, the little bit of a tangent, but just from a nuts and bolts perspective, 
Have charitable donations gone down since the tax law change that went into effect in January 1st of 2018? And I asked because there was some significant changes in that tax law driving more and more taxpayers to take the standard deduction instead of itemized deductions. And charitable uh, deductions are often itemized and now that 80 to 90 percent of American tax filers are taking a standard deduction, you lose a little bit of the tax incentive for everyday mm -hmm. Americans to make a charitable deduction, a charitable donation, I should say. Um, so have the numbers changed? Has this tax law impacted charitable donations by Americans? So it has, but it's been in an interesting way and one you might not think of. Charitable giving is actually increased, the actual dollar amount, but the number of people giving has diminished. So as we see the wealth divide uh, enlarge, the people at the top end are giving more, and those who can only take a standard deduction now are giving less, which is really unfortunate because then not everyone gets the joy of giving. Sure. And as we just spoke about, you know, there is joy in giving. I could see that. So, so total donation in terms of dollars has increased, but um, less Americans are donating, and, and you're tracing that possibly to the tax law at lower brackets because of income and wealth disparity. They either can't afford to give or the loss of the tax deduction might incentivize them not to do giving. Exactly. Okay. Another nuts and bolts question that I was curious about. Uh, we've been on a uh, focus here as we meet with clients as part of the planning and when they get to age 70 and a half or if they're already beyond 70 and a half to make sure they're aware of the qualified charitable distribution or QCD. I actually did a, uh, uh, an episode of this podcast, Arlene, uh, solely on that topic. And I'm just not sure how many people are aware of the qualified charitable distribution and how many uh, people are taking advantage of it. But first, maybe just to catch all listeners up, if you're over 70 and a half and you have an IRA, uh, pre-tax money, you're required to take a certain percentage of it out each year per IRS rules. In the first year, it's around 3.6%. You have to take the money out, and typically that's a taxable event. In fact, that's why the IRS has this rule, because they want to begin taxing the retirement money. You can opt to give that required minimum distribution money to charity, and then it would not be taxable and you could give to the charity or charities of your choice. It's not just limited to the RMD. You could actually give up to $100,000 per year to charity tax-free from your IRAs. You need to be 70 and a half. That may change. There's some pending legislation. But right now you have to be over 70 and a half. So that's the qualified charitable distribution we're going to talk about now. Did I explain that okay, Arlene? Yeah, I think you explained that great, and I so agree with you that, that qualified charitable distributions are excellent ways for people over 70 and a half to make a charitable donation. They don't have to pay income tax on the money. They don't get a tax deduction either, but it, it still allows you to move a lot of money to charity. And what I love about uh, retirement plans in general is they are the most tax-efficient way for people to give to charity also through their estate plan because retirement accounts are kind of double-taxed. And even though we have a high federal um, estate tax rate, there are still some states out there that have uh, estate taxes that start at dollar zero or a million dollars that are not specifically aligned with our federal exemption rate. And for those people in, that are living in those states, and when I lived in Connecticut, Connecticut was one of those states. I can't remember if they eliminated the 
that the, they matched up the state with the federal level or not. But what happens is it's included in your overall estate for tax purposes, and then as beneficiaries get distributions, they're taxed on that distribution as income. But if that charitable distribution goes to, I'm sorry, but if your retirement distribution goes to a charity, there is no tax on it at all. At all. So what we really get is the best tax advantage asset to give through your estate plan is your retirement asset. So thank you. Um, that was an excellent explanation. Do you think that the qualified charitable distribution is an underutilized planning tool? Or is Absolutely. It, is it, yeah. <laughs> you don't even have to finish. I, I work with a number of nonprofits, and I'm always telling them you have to really understand the ages of your donors and make sure that they know that this is a huge benefit for them. And I, I still think it's underused. It can be used a lot more. And there should be more information out that there for people. But, you know, people get lazy and they just give a regular write a check or give some other asset without sure. really speaking to their advisor to get that sound financial advice of where should I make this gift from. Beautiful. Now, let me, let me ask you, going back to what we talked about before, in terms of a, a, a benefit, I think an overlooked benefit is... Uh, how giving increases your happiness. Uh, what are some of the common motivations that lead people to donate to charity? Uh, because I don't think a lot of people go to their advisor or their attorney and or anybody else for that matter and say, boy, you know, I want to give some money today so that I can have a happy day. So what are the motivating factors? You know, I... What I've seen as motivating factors are those life events which changed you and want, or where you want to make a difference in the world. What do you want to see continue or what do you want to see go away? And when people are asked, most people really have a general sense of what matters to them and we... One of the things I do, Chris, is I work with advisors to educate them on how do you have those charitable conversations? How do you find out what's near and dear to your client's heart? How do you pass down the core values that you have as a, a parent to your children? You know, the most successful families out there, the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's, what separated them from everyone else is they actually had some, some governance in their families. And a lot of it revolved around charitable giving because it was something that the family could come together for a bigger purpose to make a difference in the world. And what I love about, about charity and working with our clients is you as an advisor can set up the exact same thing and help your clients have a successful family through things like donor advised funds and bring the family closer together so there's a discussion around governance and what our money means. And it's not just about me, 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 but it's around us as a family and how we want to be remembered. So they're real powerful conversations that we can have with our clients. And when you look at the U.S. Trust study on high net worth individuals, although we think we're having those conversations as advisors, we're really not having them, them enough, not to our client's satisfaction. So there's a lot more room for us to improve, to really get to know our clients' personal goals so we can help them effectively manage their personal wealth and their objectives, not just during their life, but after their life as well, so they can make a legacy that they never imagined. So that, that makes sense? Yeah, that was so wonderfully said, and, and I love the line, I'm paraphrasing, uh, because it gives clarity in my mind where you said, you know, people have an idea of what they want to see continued, 
or what they would like to see stopped or changed. And that's a simple way to, to cut to the chase, if you will, of, of what would be important to someone, whether it's a veterans charity or some type of medical research and that kind of thing. So I think that was, that was so well said. Well, well, thank you. And, you know, a lot of that revolves around working with younger people and millennials give completely differently. And we have to be flexible to how they give and, you know, you know, what do you want to see remain? Well, you know, I want to see the fresh water remain for people, you know. So it's one of the activities I do with clients, I use a set of picture cards. And this way, multiple generations can engage in this philanthropic conversation. And the picture cards are everything from, like, books, to people graduating, to sports, to the environment. And everyone in the family gets their own deck. And even a three-year-old can participate in it because you pick a picture that resonates and one that doesn't. And what I found is like the Gen 1 might pick the beautiful trees and Gen 3 might pick litter on the street and they both come to the same conclusion that we have a problem with our environment and that's an important thing to maintain and improve on. And it's a really powerful exercise when even a three-year-old can say, I don't like garbage, it's ugly. And then you get to see generations come together around a single cause or causes based on picture cards and their values. it's always a pleasure to watch that happen in a family yeah. setting. I can see that. And I understand uh, when we were speaking before we began recording uh, that you have a, a values worksheet that helps advisors and their clients uh, work through their values. This is related to what you just spoke about, I assume, right? Yeah. It's, you know, one of the things I want to help people create is their philanthropic plan. Like we said before, it's a journey. It's going to change over time. But the key thing with any giving is incorporating your core values into your giving. It makes it more rewarding and fulfilling. So I'm delighted and be happy to share that with your listeners, that values worksheet. So if if, if, uh, one of our listeners or... Um, even if I am working with a client and they may not have heard the podcast, hopefully all of my clients are listening, but um, wh- how would we get the values worksheet? Yeah, you could just send me an email at arlenecogan.com with the title values in the subject line, and I'd be delighted to send out that worksheet. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. At what age, as we kind of wrap up, you mentioned children a few times, and a lot of what I... Um, look to is is as far as being a a parent. I have a child in college and I have a 13-year-old in middle school and so obviously they're not toddlers. But at what age, how do you incorporate the message of giving and charity to children? What are some simple ways for, you know, let's say for me where, let's say I didn't do a good job when they were very young and I think I did an okay job, but let's say I didn't do it. <laughs> you did better than you thought, Chris. I bet you did better than you thought. And so let's say now they're, they're 13 and 19, and I really want to impart this wisdom to them. How might I do that? Okay, I'm going to take a step back before I get to the 13 and 19-year-old forgiving and share with you the paper bag game, which you could start when kids are literally, you know, two and three years old to teach gratitude and generosity and giving, if that's okay with you. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So I created the paper bag game (laughs) because I had two daughters 16 months apart And, you know, we are a successful family. We live in a nice neighborhood. We have plenty. And my mother hated stuff laying around the house. So we barely had any uh, tchotchkes on the tables. Everything was kind of clean. And before their birthdays or any holidays, 
there would be this abundance of toys and stuff they already had. So we came up with the paper bag game, which basically the girls were required to fill a brown paper shopping bag full of toys that they were finished using or no longer wanted to give to less fortunate kids to make room for the new toys and abundance they would get in the next few weeks for their birthday or the holidays. And I could tell you when we started this game, it took weeks because they were so close in age and one would want it and one wouldn't want it. But then over the years, what happened is they actually developed the muscle of, oh, I'm done with this. I don't want it anymore. Hey, sister, do you want it? You don't. And then they'd automatically start filling up that bag to give away and share their abundance with others less fortunate. So you can start as young as two and three years old. That's fantastic. Teaching your kids how to make a difference. Now, when we look at other kids and as they get older, you know, for teenagers, that 13-year-old, what can you do to participate in community service or social activism projects in your neighborhood? With my girls, we would volunteer at Potluck in the Park, which is a weekly um, food for the hungry and homeless that they would do. There's also stuff on uh, ephilanthropy.com is a great place for teenagers to go. And then you can look at social conscious branding purchases. You know, you have Bombas, those socks, buy a right. pair of socks, they give socks, uh, Tom's Shoes, Warby Parker. There are a lot of organizations out there. So when we're we're voting with our dollars by purchasing stuff. We're also making a difference. And that's great for teenagers to, to get involved in. And they start to understand how, you know, it's almost like investing, right? I'm investing in a company that's making a difference in our world. So there's a lot of good things around that. For, Those are good suggestions. And uh, I like the paper bag game. That's a terrific uh, a little a terrific little strategy that's simple but super effective, I bet. Super effective. Now, I mean, I, my, I'm an empty nester now, but there's still a bag in our garage that just gets filled. <laughs> you know, it's an ongoing, oh, I'm done with this outfit or that outfit. And, that, you know, they automatically put in the books they're done reading. And it, it, it develops a great habit for them. Very nice. So if... If uh, listeners wanted to get more information about you, uh, where should they go? Uh, my website, ArleneCogan.com. It's spelled A-R-L-E-N-E. C-O-G as in George, E as in Edward, N as in Nancy.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed the discussion, and I hope we could work together uh, in the future and collaborate um, on some good planning opportunities. That would be wonderful. I'm sure we have that in our future as well. And I look forward to it. It's been a pleasure to be on the podcast. Great. Thanks again, Arlene. My pleasure. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of Sage Point Financial Incorporated and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Please note the information being provided is strictly as a courtesy. When you link to any of the websites provided here, you are leaving this website. We make no representation as to the completeness or accuracy of the information provided at these websites, nor is the company liable for any direct or indirect technical or system issues or any consequences arising out of your access to your use of third-party technologies websites, information, and programs made available through this website. When you access one of these websites, you are leaving our website and assume total responsibility and risk for your use of the websites you are linking to. 
Securities and advisory services are offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, insurance services offered through Elliott Wealth Management, LLC, not affiliated with Sage Point Financial. Simply Financial is part of the Exvadio Podcast Network. You can find Exvadio Podcasts at exvadio.com slash podcast, the Apple Podcasts app, iTunes Store, iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you find podcasts. So join us and stay informed and entertained.